going to read from verse 54. So Luke 22, 54. Taking you straight to a point, um, and this is in a series we're in at the moment where, where insert whatever name or thing met Jesus. Um, we've looked at different characters that have met Jesus. Um, we've even looked at when the elements met Jesus. Remember when Jesus spoke to the storm and the storm just went shh. Uh, today we're looking at when Peter met Jesus. Now that spent about three years together at this point, um, hanging out, seeing miracles happen, um, awesome things going on. Uh, Peter had, had been through ups and downs with Jesus and, and it comes to this point where um, Jesus has just been seized um, and we know what happens next, don't we? So, Luke 22, 54. I'm in the CSB version. So, they seized him, led him away, and brought him into the high priest's house. Notice this. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. Have you ever followed Christ from a distance? Ever sat back, um, knowing that you should be up there, trying to do something, but you just couldn't? Yeah, yeah. You just couldn't, couldn't get there. There was a massive gap between you and, you and Jesus, but you were, you were trying. Peter was following at a distance. There, they, they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter amongst them. When a servant saw him sitting in the light and looked closely at him, she said, this man was with him too. So she was calling him out, saying, you were with him, Jesus. But he denied it. I love, it, love the language here. Woman, I don't know him. After a little while, someone else saw him and said, you're, you're one of them too. I love his language again. Man, I'm not. <laughs> Pete, as we'll see in a moment, is a fascinating character. You okay if I call him Pete? You're good if I call him Pete? All right. About an hour later, so they're hanging out, around this campfire, about an hour later, another kept insisting, this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you, what is going through Peter's head? He spent three years with him. He's a massive overreacher and an overtalker and says, I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. Um, and then he's sitting there in this moment and, and it just denies him three times. What is going on? And check this out. So he said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And then immediately, while he was still speaking, as he's finishing that sentence, the rooster crowed. I think this is one of the most powerful sentences in the Bible. Check this out. Then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Can you imagine the creator of the universe like sitting in the distance in chains. You've tried to follow him, couldn't do it. You tried to stay awake a few hours earlier, you couldn't do that. Useless, pathetic. <laughs> he calls you out and says, you'll deny me before the rooster crows. Three times. No, I never will. I'm so good. Got guns. Whatever. Jesus looks at him. The creator of the universe turns and looks at him. Makes eye contact. Have a look at what happens next. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And then in verse 62, and he went outside and he wept bitterly. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your life, obviously. I thank you for your death and also for your resurrection. I thank you for the word that we have, which we know as the Bible I thank you for that it is power for us here today, this morning, as a family gathering in your name. I pray that you'd come and speak to us, not through my voice, help me to get out the road. Um, and I pray that our ears would be open, our hearts would be receptive to what you have to say this morning. May your kingdom come and your will be done in Jesus' name. Amen. So who's Peter? Um, Peter is, is obviously, he's a fisherman. Um, he's a tough character. Has anyone ever met a legit fisherman? I'm not talking weekender, like just going squidding. 
Um, have you, what, what, what's a fisherman look like? Rough, tough, like weather, they've got leathery, leather, leathery face. Anyone here with leathery face? There he is over there. In a good way, in a good way. Like they've, they're, just, they're, they're strong, like they're really, really strong. Um, and and they've, they're out in the elements. Have you ever been out fishing on a boat for a while? The sun's beating down, it's salty, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on. Um, it's hard work as well. It's sort of a thankless task. And, but Peter um, was also known as he followed Christ to be the first amongst the disciples or the, the chief uh, leader of the disciples. Uh, he was also mentioned uh, more times than the other disciples in the Gospels uh, and often mentioned first before the others. So when the names are lined up, Pete's sort of at the, first, at the, at the front. It's like, yeah, full marks. His name was mentioned around 120 times. He's also the guy that, that uh, used to fish on water, but he also walked on water. And we know that story, for those of you that have been around Christianity for a little while. Like he, he, he got out of the boat. He got out of the boat in the middle of a sea and uh, this body of water. Can you just imagine it? I was sitting, we've got a pool. I was sitting there this morning with Rachel going, do you think that actually happened? Like, you think about it, like, walked on water. Any physicists here? Like it, like it just doesn't, like it's a miracle. He walked on water and then his eyes drifted off from Jesus. Notice the look. The eyes drifted off from Jesus and he, and, he, and he sunk. He had that experience. Jesus himself called Peter the rock on which I'll build my church. And then Jesus went on to say a couple of verses later in Matthew, Jesus went on to say, um, and then I, I'm going to die, right? I'm, I'm going to die. I, I need to die. And Peter says, I will not let you die. And what happens next? Jesus goes, get behind me, Satan! Imagine being called Satan by Jesus. Can you imagine that? Like a few verses earlier, you get called the rock. Oh yeah, the rock. Like he's got this sort of bravado, this confidence, Pete. He's sort of, you know, I'm strong, I'm a fisherman, I know what to do. People follow me. Um, I'll be a fisher of men as well, not just fish. Uh, he gets called the rock by Christ. And so he's got this confidence, but then Jesus also calls him Satan. So he's a bit, he's a bit, conflicted this guy Peter he's brash opinionated just read through I encourage you even after today to read through uh, some of the gospels and look at the life of Peter and look at what he said and what he did he was just brash had an opinion on everything he'd just go bang got it bang got it um never cut someone's do someone's ear off have you, have you got anyone said anyone got swords here Peter literally whipped someone's ear off out of frustration, but just before Jesus was seized, he's like, I'm not going to let this happen. What's the sword noise? Is it shing, shing? And just goes, I'm not sure if he's a bad shot because he's like a normally casting nets and he just, but he just ch chops the servant's ear off. He's aggressive, Arr, like a pirate. Maybe, I don't know. So Pete, was a fascinating character and in this room this room this morning we are fascinating characters we each have a story to tell and this is just one which is Peter so there he was Peter was in Luke 22 54 he was sitting around this this fire the fire is uh, in the Greek is the word anthrakia which is a heap of burning coals and he was there warming himself. In Matthew, John, it talks about that Peter was there warming himself. It was obviously cold. In the work I do as exec coach, as a um, leadership and culture work that we do in the consulting, there's, there's a concept called first person, which is where when we get into first person, and this happens to us as human beings regularly, when something happens, we, we go into first person and it's our egocentric self. It's where I'm only focused on my needs and what I want. Um, and I can't actually think beyond myself. I'm actually captured by my fear. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm caught up in that. And I, I, I'm concerned for my safety. And so Peter was following Jesus at a distance. He ends up at this fire around these servants, um, with these servants. And he's there for himself. He's there for warmth. But obviously he's curious. He's the only one of the disciples that's there. Um, but he's sitting in first-person perspective, going, "What? Oh, I, 
he obviously feels a pull. He's really, really torn at this, at this point, but he's absolutely failed. When the Lord turned and looked at Peter, he went outside and he, and he wept bitterly. Um, and that was a moment where Peter had declared all these things, I'm going to follow Christ, I'm going to make it with you, I'm going to go with you, Jesus, because I can, because I'm strong and I know some things. But he couldn't. The, 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 the word wept in, in the Greek, it talks of this, this, it's a connection around painful wailing, a mournful and a lamenting, mostly at the death of, at the death of something. Have you ever missed the mark? You ever, ever failed, made a promise, uh, couldn't keep it? Uh, as, a, as a son or a daughter of God, have you ever... Uh, felt like I'm not cutting it or I've, I'm not walking with God the way I should be walking with God. Peter is experiencing this here at this anthracia, at this burning coals with these people. Jesus looks at him have you ever had the look from your partner before? Any, any marrieds here? Just, if you're, sit, you're sitting next to someone, if you're sitting next to someone, just give them the look. Go, okay, give them the look. You know, do you know what I'm talking about? The look? So, I've, I've been married for 23 years. Yeah. And I've, I get the look. I, 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 I'd say this in a nice way, babe. I get the look probably most days, but that's not about you, it's about me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> get the look right now. Oh, the look, it, it um, you know the look when you've done something wrong? Do you remember that as a kid, like the, the, your parents, when you've done something naughty, you've, you've thrown the toys out the cot, whatever you've done, you get the look, um, and now you might, be, you might be the parent and you're the one giving the look, and the crazy eyes. I can't really do it because I'm just such a friendly, nice guy. <laughs> That's not true, is it? Kids are sitting up the back. They keep me honest. But the, the look, I've got a mother-in-law as well. Careful. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> oh, the look. I remember when we shared with uh, my mother-in-law um, that Rachel was pregnant when Rachel was 16. Yeah. How do you think that look was? She's four foot eight, but the look was like a giant. Like, oh man, I was I was shivering, still to this day. But the Lord, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. I wonder what the look was, because um, Jesus knew he was going to do this. Jesus knew he was going to fail, like all us, all of us, every single one of us, we're all failures. You're a bunch of losers. <laughs> no, seriously, own it. Own it. Because it's true. Because Jesus was looking at Peter, going, you did it. You did it. And do you know what? That's okay. Because I knew you were going to do it. And I'm here to catch you. So Jesus looks at Peter with this intense truth. Can you, and the conviction of truth leads to repentance. So, it's, so the look of conviction of Jesus and truth leads us to repentance, to that gift. But it's also grace. It's okay. It's okay. Now, Peter didn't know that it was going to be okay. All he felt from Jesus was, oh, I've stuffed it. I'm done. I'm out of here. He left. He runs and he, he gets out of there. The look. God is always looking I'm actually going to invite my wife, Rachel, to come up and read from Psalm 139. So give her a clap, don't give me a clap. Do you want the look? Can I do the yeah, look do first? Some of this? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm reading from Psalm 139, verse 1 to 18. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. 
you are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, Lord. You have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This wondrous knowledge is beyond me. It is too lofty. I am unable to reach it. Where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I live at the eastern horizon or settle at the western limits, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold on to me. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night shines like the day. Darkness and light are all alike to you. For it was you who created my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will praise you because I've been remarkably and wondrously made. Your works are wondrous and I know this very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret, when I was formed in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. God, how precious your thoughts are to me, how vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I am still with you. Some great reading there. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere and, and he, he knows. So Peter um, gets the look from Jesus and I, I have been praying this all week or for the last few weeks actually that we... If you're hearing this, if you're here in the moment or you're listening um, from home, online, later on, I pray that you receive the look from God. I pray that you receive a, a look from Jesus because it's life-changing. Rachel and I have been married for 23 years. Um, early on, uh, we separated twice. The second time we separated, um, we were living apart. I was living in a one-bedroom apartment by myself. We had one little kid at the time. She was two. On the weekends, I'd have our, my little two-year-old daughter, and during the week, Rachel would have her. We uh, were going to get separated. I went and visited a lawyer and said, how does this work? You to, and then apparently you have to wait for 12 months. It's like, really? <laughs> really? Um, anyway, I was working for a Christian man. He gave me a book to read about masculinity uh, and what a real man actually does to love. I didn't know this. I was just immature. I'd never had any good examples. And so this challenged me to reach out again and I started reaching out to Rachel to hang out with her and she rejected me. And when a bloke gets rejected, what does a bloke do? Does a Peter. Stuff you, I'm going fishing. Right? Metaphorically, I don't, don't fish. I <laughs> but we've got our version of that, right? I'm going fishing. And so I just gave up. And I remember one night, I woke up cold sweats, bawling my eyes out after having a dream. And here's the dream. Jesus was standing opposite me. I don't know what situation it was, but he was standing opposite me. And he was looking at me in the eyes. And he was just approaching me. He was just coming toward me in love. Like he wa I knew he wanted to embrace me. And he was just looking at me. And as he got closer, and close enough, sorry, what's your name? Alex. He was started off at about where Alex is, about two or three, two metres in front. And Jesus was walking towards me. When Jesus got close enough, his arms stretched out towards me, and I couldn't accept his love because of how crap I am, how shameful I am of my own stuff. And so I actually, I hit I hit his arms down, both of them, like that. And I'm like, I just, cause I, be, only because of my brokenness, right? Because of what I'd done. Think Peter. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm tapping out. I can't do this. Maybe I was wrong. Slapped his arms down. And J the arms go down like this, and, and Jesus' head drops in, in this dream I had. And his, and his head lifts up slowly, and he's, Jesus is crying. And walks towards me and he embraces me. I woke up bawling my eyes out 
uh, sweating, cold sweat. And I, because I knew exactly what I had to do. Uh, I had to pursue and love unconditionally. The look of Jesus is so, so powerful and so, so redeeming and forgiving. And we all need it, don't we? We all need it, regardless of what stage we're at, um, what we've been through, what we're going through right now, what might be coming up in the future. We need the look of Christ. A, for conviction, and B, for grace and forgiveness. It's, tra- it's life transforming. I'm just going to pray right now. If you feel comfortable, just close your eyes. Father God, I pray that as a church family, we would all receive your look of love and conviction. I pray that you would look at your children in the most profound and wonderful way in which you do. I pray that you would convict us of where we're at and what's going on. And I pray that you would guide us into your embrace and into your truth, just like you did with Peter. I pray this for all of us physically here, if listening online, I pray this for our children in Kids Church and the youth that are hanging out as well. We pray this in Jesus' name this morning. Amen. Because you can just imagine, like, Peter is, he's, like, stuffed up. What's he thinking? He's gone walk about. He went fishing. He actually went fishing. He's like, maybe Jesus was full of it. Because Jesus died. Peter, Peter wasn't there. The only one there was John, um, looking, and a few others, uh, at, at what happened when Jesus got crucified. He went fishing. He's tapped out. He is done. Maybe I'm not the rock. Maybe I'm just a little pebble. <laughs> Maybe I, there's, that's not, he's not the Messiah. He was just a prophet. But what about all those miracles? What about all that stuff that was told and that, that, the, the amazing things that occurred over the previous three years? What happened? So he was in this space of, you can just imagine his cycle. You know, can, you, those of you that have anxiety, you know exactly what that's like. It's just loop, 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 loop. And it keeps going around and around and around and around. He was in that, an intense version of that. You could probably define it as a, a depression, like he was in that space. But we know that that's only, that's only part of the story, hey. Um, I just invite you in, in the Word to jump to John 21. We're going to look at a second fire, a second anthracia, a heap of burning coals. But this time it wasn't a fire of failure. It was a fire of forgiveness, freedom. We'll pick it up, John 21. Verse 3, Peter's there and he, goes, he says this, I'm going fishing, Peter said to them, and we're coming with you, they told him. So he's, he's got this natural leadership quality, and you know, natural leaders, they'll just say something and people go, I'll follow you, <laughs> like lemmings, remember lemmings anyone, that game, old school, I am 42. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing, verse 4. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them. How funny is this? I reckon there's a bit of humour here. Do you think Jesus is funny or just this serious Swedish dude walking around in robes? He was funny, I'm telling you. He gave us humour. Do, do you think God's funny? Check this out. Hey, friends, Jesus calls to them. He knows that they haven't seen him. He's died. He's risen again. Jesus knows all that, but... He's just rocked up on the shore. They're in the boat doing what they know to do. He goes, you don't have any fish, do you? (laughs) Losers. (laughs) That's the joke. No, (laughs) they answered, we don't. Cast your net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. The disciple, the one Jesus loved, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And I think, I'm going to read this in a moment, but I think Pete thought he could walk on water again. Just check this out. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him for he'd taken it off and plunged into the sea. I'm thinking at that point, I'll be going to walk on water again because it's Jesus. Someone's going to look at you more. Anyway, since they were not far from the land, about 100 yards, that's 30, uh, 100 yards, 30 metres, um, the other disciples came by boat dragging the full net of fish. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire, anthracia, 
It's only mentioned twice in the Bible, anthracia. Once for failure, once for forgiveness. And we go through both of these fires regularly as, as followers of Christ. We all do as human beings. Failure. We need forgiveness. Um, they saw the charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Come and have breakfast. I love that. The risen saviour says, come and have brekkie. Probably brunch. He told them. None, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And then Jesus came. He took the bread and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. Where do you think the disciples' minds were going at this point? The Last Supper, maybe the feeding of the 4,000, maybe the feeding of the 5,000. They were just, wow, like we're sitting here. He was dead a few days ago. We'd just been through this torturous experience and we're having a meal with Christ. This morning we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to incorporate communion. We have communion every week. Um, as a church family, but we're going to incorporate communion as part of the preach. So I'm going to invite you up, and I want to read these words. Verse 13 in John 21. Jesus came, took the bread, and he gave it to them. This morning, I invite you to come and grab the emblems of communion, and I invite you to go back to your seat and just hold it in your hands for a moment. And we'll take it together as a church family in a moment. So let's have communion together. There they were, looking at the risen Christ. Jesus gave them the bread and looking at them, risen. There was a sense of anticipation and excitement. You could just imagine over that campfire, anthracia, a promise What's going to happen next? Jesus says to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, feed my lambs. The second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Jesus said, uh, Peter said, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. He asked him a third time, hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was at that moment grieved that Jesus asked him a third time. Doubt probably crept back into Peter's consciousness. Maybe Jesus is trying to call me out and shame me and remind me of my sin, my failure. And it wasn't that at all. That was just doubt. And I just encourage you as children of God to just remove the doubt. Let go of the past. Jesus forgives you if you bring it to him. Do you love me, Jesus said the third time. Lord, you know everything as we saw in Psalm 139, he sees everything. He knew you before you were even created. You're so wonderfully and fearfully made. And then Peter said, I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Denied three times, restored three times. That's the business that God has with you and me and this world to look at us and with truth and grace and to redeem us and restore us to where we should be. Peter became the rock. He experienced Pentecost. He experienced the birth of the church, miracles. Sick and lame, just wanted to sit in his shadow to be healed. But yet he was a failure. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that 
tremendous than what Jesus does for us. And we're just like Pete. And this morning as we take communion, we remember the power of Jesus. The two fires, the fire of failure and the fire of forgiveness. And we thank the Lord for his goodness.